the DJ has apologized for his overreaction on television. We talked about that and he apologized for that. Describing Drogba's response to being eliminated by Barcelona in the 2009 Champions League semi-final as an overreaction seems lenient. Unless, of course, you consider screaming it's a f***ing disgrace on live TV normal behavior. But to many onlookers, Drogba's anger was justified as it appeared his team had been the victim of a nasty UEFA stitch-up that had seen the Blues denied four penalties on a tumultuous night at Stamford Bridge. In this video, we examine the context surrounding this controversial game and ask whether this is a tale of bad luck, bad losers, or bad blood. People like Mourinho are the enemy of football. To understand the dynamics between UEFA, Chelsea, and FC Barcelona on the night of their infamous 2009 Champions League semi-final, you need to rewind to when the teams were drawn against each other in the second round of the UCL in 2005. The clubs were on contrasting trajectories. Barcelona were living in the shadow of their illustrious past and trying desperately to reconnect with their cultural identity. Sound familiar? Former player Frank Rijkaard had been appointed to deliver that vision. Chelsea, on the other hand, were striving to forge an identity despite an absence of any meaningful history. The club represented new money, and it seemed hell-bent on disrupting the established order. The face of that charge was a brash young manager who'd already tasted victory in Europe. I'm sorry, I'm a bit arrogant. We have a top manager. I'm not one of the bottle. I think I'm a special one. Given their contrasting outlooks, it's possible tensions would have escalated unaided. However, tempers flared when the Portuguese accurately predicted Rijkaard's team in a pre-match press conference. Barcelona is, is normally a club and a, and a fan base which is very, very generous, but they hate him. They absolutely hate him. The usually ice-cool Rijkaard bristled and attacked Mourinho's playing style. They're a great team, a great team, very functional. The mounting hostility was exasperated by a tight game. Chelsea led at the break, but the dismissal of Drogba by referee Anders Frisk swung momentum Barca's way. Los Cules edged the game 2-1 and the second leg was finally poised. Never one to miss a trick, Mourinho put pressure on the authorities by suggesting he had seen Rijkaard in Frisk's dressing room at halftime. This interference made it impossible for the Swede to oversee the return fixture. After a barrage of abuse and death threats, Frisk announced his retirement. UEFA was outraged and brought disciplinary proceedings against the Portuguese. Its director of communications even added Mourinho should shut up and get on with the game. The second leg took place before any hearing could be scheduled. Pierluigi Colina officiated over a scintillating encounter in which Mourinho confounded critics by removing the handbrake. Chelsea led 3-2 at the break and settled the affair with a late and controversial winner from Captain John Terry that the Italian would later admit should not have stood. I realized that what I had completely missed was contact between Ricardo Calvallo and the Barcelona goalkeeper Victor Valdez. Had I seen that, the goal would not have been given. Mourinho's day in court eventually came and he was banned from setting foot inside the stadium for two games. The ill feeling towards Chelsea was so evident, UEFA was forced to deny a rift. Of course, we want a good relationship with Chelsea. No one becomes a pariah. Mourinho has since gloated about defying this ban to speak with his players during the home leg of the quarterfinal against Bayern, adding that UEFA suspected he was on the premises and that he had to be smuggled out in a laundry cart. Oh my God. UEFA really tried, but they could not find me. What I did in that game, in that dressing room, I'm not proud of it because I went against the rules. I'm proud of it as a leader. By the time 2009 rolled around, the clubs had enjoyed contrasting fortunes. Mourinho had put Chelsea on the map, but European success eluded him and the hierarchy grew weary of his antics. He was shown the door in September 2007. But his influence over the club, Chelsea's personality was now Mourinho's, and football endured. His counterpunching tactics, which many would argue are tactics of negation, had become synonymous with success and were adopted across the continent. They were not, however, universally adored. Put a sh hanging from a stick in the middle of this passionate, crazy stadium, and there are people who will tell you it's a work of art. It's not. It's a sh hanging from a stick. Chelsea tried to shed this association with the appointment of Phil Scolari in 2008. He accepted a brief to play attacking football, but was met with resistance from within the dressing room and lost his job after just seven months. We've gone from Prince Charming to Godzilla, haven't we? An acknowledgement that Mourinho was in the team's DNA may have been behind the appointment of Hus Hiddink, a man who made his name by frustrating the biggest teams in Europe while leading PSV to European glory in 1988. Barcelona had fared better. 
The season after their tempestuous encounter with Chelsea, they got their revenge and went on to beat Arsenal in the final. But one swallow does not make a summer. After two trophyless seasons, Rijkaard was relieved of his duties. The club turned to the 38-year-old coach of their B team, a former player with no experience and a deep understanding of its footballing traditions, Pep Guardiola. If Chelsea had lost their messianic leader, the Blaugrana had found theirs. He proceeded to wow the world with Tiki Taka. Take the ball, pass the ball, take the ball, pass the ball. For many neutrals, this mesmerizing style proved the perfect tonic for the anti-football of Mourinho and now Hiddink. The game was eager to learn whether playing with the ball could prove as successful as playing without it. And the Champions League semi-final between these two clubs was set to reveal the answer. The first leg produced no surprises. Chelsea were disciplined, intelligent, and compact. Barcelona moved the ball but were unable to pick the lock. The game finished 0-0, but it was not devoid of controversy. Bozingua hauled Henri to the ground in the penalty area and evaded reprimand. Balak narrowly escaped a second yellow. Eto was wrongly denied a goal-scoring opportunity by the linesman. Guardiola made no excuses. The result is what it is. You can't say in football that you deserve more. The stage was set for a winner-takes-all incarnation of defense versus attack, of wealth against heritage. The return fixture brought more of the same. Barcelona enjoyed 71% possession but lacked a cutting edge. Chelsea were the picture of efficiency as they looked to pounce on lapses. The deadlock was broken by an unlikely source. Michael Essien's thunderous volley cannoned off the bar and beyond a hapless Valdez. Stamford Bridge exploded into life. Chelsea had Barcelona where they wanted them, but one man was about to make a name for himself, referee Tom Henning Evreba. Depending on who you ask, the Norwegian made as many as six game-changing errors. Unfortunately for the hosts, they were on the wrong side of four, and they all occurred inside the area. The first was a foul on Malota that was erroneously adjudged to have been committed outside the box. Next was Abidal's tug on Drogba's shirt. Piquet almost slapped away Anelka's chip touch before Balak thumped a blistering volley against the raised arm of Samuel Eto at the death. The German chased the referee in disbelief. This last denial was particularly galling for the home support as it came minutes after Iniesta leveled the tie with a sumptuous injury time strike. Chaotic scenes followed the final whistle. Wearing flip-flops, the now injured Drogba stormed the pitch to confront Ovrba. He swore down the lens of a broadcasting camera as security staff escorted him down the tunnel. Suspicions of foul play mounted. In a rare move, UEFA was forced to deny meddling to stop another all-English final. It's a load of crap and you can quote me on that. If anything, it's a media conspiracy against UEFA. Barcelona had a very different reading of events. They used the results to take the moral high ground and reinforce the narrative that this was, ironically, a victory for sporting integrity. Football loved football tonight. Referee Ovrova needed a police escort to leave the country. Three years later, he was still the target of hate. Just yesterday, I got an email from a Chelsea fan saying he wanted to kill me and my family. So, was Chelsea cheated? Hiddink admits his suspicions. This is the only time I thought a match could have been fixed. But still, if you push the right button in my soul, then you will find still a little bit of anger. Ovrova concedes mistakes were made. I was happy with 95% of my decisions, but there were some decisions that were not dealt with in the correct manner. However, there is no evidence of coercion, and most of the decisions are debatable. Furthermore, Overba gave Chelsea a huge advantage when he dismissed Abidal with 20 minutes to go for a foul he didn't commit. Controversy will forever surround this game, but two things seem irrefutable. Opponents of VAR would do well to remember the events of this match. I think that one is what VAR was brought here for. Folks at Chelsea who felt the club would get the benefit of any doubt on that night had forgotten how they arrived at this fixture. So, there you have it. The story behind one of the most contentious games in Champions League history. Think there's more to this? Reckon Chelsea was robbed? Or did they get what was coming to them? Let us know in the comments. And remember, it ain't over until Andres says so. All this talk of injustice got you curious? Check out this video on the eight most controversial goals in history. Just don't show Didier Drogba.